Loving Father in heaven, we are grateful this morning, dear Lord, on a rainy morning here in Arkansas to have you with us. We want to invite you into our presence and into our lives. For those who may be viewing this on the internet also, we want to pray for them and for their uh, enlightenment that they may receive uh, from uh, listening this morning. Bless them, dear Lord, in their studies of the Bible at home. And bless me, dear Lord, as I present these things that uh, we would uh, see some things about uh, your movements among us as a people and that we would see that you are still uh, the leader of this movement, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Bless us, we pray, and uh, please be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I've been asked to come to give some thoughts here at Bonnerdale with uh, reflections on uh, the history of Adventism in relation to some things that we've recently been studying. And one of the things we've been recently been studying is on biblical hermeneutics and how it relates to uh, the history of these two charts that you see behind me. This is the 1843 chart. This is the 1850 chart. And there's a text in the Bible that I want to turn to. Uh, we're going to go to Nehemiah, and we're also going to go to the book of Revelation first. Now, there is an uh, attempt by some today in the church, and I should say that this is not a witch hunt. This is not an attempt by anybody uh, to uh, be uh, unkind uh, to those who have these ideas, but we want to try to c convince them that uh, they need to see things in a different light. And that's really our effort uh, this week. And uh, they, are, they are our brothers and sisters, and that we uh, are as desirous for their uh, eternal welfare as we are for our own. And if you'll turn in Revelation chapter 14, I want to notice uh, verse 6. This is the, the first part of the first angel's message. Verses 6 and 7 is the first angel's message of Revelation 14. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it says... I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. Now, when this was first given in the 1840s, and Miller began in, really in the 1830s to give this message, uh, it was the everlasting gospel, and it is still the everlasting gospel today. And there are some in the church that for some time now since... Uh, around 1890 and coming forward into our own time, they believe that what they see on these charts is only arithmetic and mathematical calculations. They don't believe that what they see here is the everlasting gospel. But the text is clear in Revelation 14, verse 6, that what was in this movement, the seer of Patmos declares as the everlasting gospel. Now, fast forward into our own time, and uh, many of us today don't see it as the everlasting gospel. They see Millerite history and the things connected with these two charts as plaze. They see it as past history that we don't need. They want to write it off and throw it into the ash can of Adventist history. But I would say that uh, they're making a grave mistake, because in this history is the Lord Jesus Christ. And with him, uh, he has brought a movement into existence. And without him, the Seventh-day Adventist Church would not exist. And uh, this is our uh, goal this week, to show some things about where we are in our concepts and our beliefs in regard to the great Advent movement of the time of the Millerites, leading on then to the time of the Sabbatarian Adventists that you see up here on this chart above me. This is the time of the Millerites. This is the time of the Sabbatarian Adventists. The Sabbatarian Adventists came into history after the uh, great disappointment of October 22, 1844, at the introduction of the third angel's message. And here was the introduction of the, of the uh, empowerment of the first angel's message. This is the everlasting gospel, and it is in this history. But as in the times of old, uh, there have been dis some disappointments in the history of God's people. And uh, there are some who understand what Paul writes about in this, these two texts, Galatians 3.29 and Galatians 3.28, that if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. So the everlasting gospel is also in the uh, life of the story of the 
Patriarch Abraham. And uh, he's the uh, representative of those who will uh, live by faith, for the just shall live by faith, according to Habakkuk and Romans chapter 1, and verse 16 and 17. But in Nehemiah, I want, that's where I want you to turn, in Nehemiah chapter uh, 9, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 9 uh, through 17. In the history of ancient Israel, they also came to a point in which they didn't understand the gospel. And I would submit to you that uh, today in Adventism, we don't understand the everlasting gospel. We are at a loss really to place our history in uh, the correct position of uh, what the gospel was to the Millerites and what the gospel was to the early Sabbatarian Adventists like Ella White, James White, Uriah Smith, uh, Loughborough, and others. For them, what you see on these two charts was uh, the Rock of Ages. It was the everlasting gospel. It was to them a, uh, an encounter with the Savior. Now, in this history below is the history of ancient Israel. This is the history of the Millerites and Sabbatarian Adventists. This is the history of ancient Israel that you see below it. And we put them on the board like this because it's line upon line. We can compare the histories to see how the gospel impacted the history of the Millerites and Sabbatarian Adventists and also how the gospel inter interacted or impacted uh, the lives of uh, ancient Israel. The first number you see at the bottom here is the year 1,921 years B.C. That is the call of the patriarch Abraham. And the text in Galatians 3.29 is, If you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. And the gospel is, all, is about the times of the Gentiles. The uh, everlasting gospel, uh, Abraham was a Gentile when he was called by God out of Babylon. And he began a uh, peculiar history of God's remnant church that will take us through down uh, to the close of earth's history and the second coming of Christ. So the Bible and the gospel has always been about the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Jews were the special representatives to all the nations of the earth who represent the Gentile church. And Abraham is the representative of the Gentiles. And he was called by God out of Ur of the Chaldees uh, in 1921 B.C. Now, when you get to the story of Nehemiah, it's down here in uh, several, over a millennium later, a millennium and a half later, almost two millennium, you come to the time period of Nehemiah, which is right in this time period, which is 408. This is the completion of the rebuilding of the work of Nehemiah in 408 B.C. And that's where we'll pick up our story in the uh, second chapter of Nehemiah. And... Uh, it reads, Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains and the army and horsemen with me. When Sanablat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, <coughs> the servant, the Ammonite, heard, it, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Now there are a lot of things you can understand from this story. I believe that... Uh, this man is a representative man. Nehemiah is a representative man. And he not only represents some of the historical characters in the Millerite time period, but he also represents you and I. And that means that uh, as we read this story, if we understand the relationship that God has with his people, which is peculiar, that means that it's very close and it's uh, like a father to a son. That's what I mean by peculiar. We are this representative man. And the enemies of God do not like to see uh, the man that God uses to uh, be a welfare to the children of Israel. The enemy does not appreciate this. And verse 11 says, So I came to Jerusalem, and, there was, and I was there for three days. Now, I don't think it's an accident that this story is talking about three days. I think it is in close relationship to the history of the Millerites, where we have the first, the second, and third angels' messages. There are also three... Three items in this history. But Nehemiah, nevertheless, was there for three days. And in verse 12 it says, And I rose in the night. I want you to notice that it was at the night time, it was a time of darkness that Nehemiah began to view the city. And he'd come to view the city because he had heard of the desolation of the city, that the walls were torn down and they weren't finished, and the work that had been supposed to have been done in Jerusalem was not yet finished. And he went in before the king and even though that he knew that going in before the king would, uh, with a sad, sad countenance may cost him his life, uh, finally, uh, the emotional trauma that he was under because of the reports that he'd got from the city that he loved, Jerusalem, 
was so great that he could not keep back his feelings. And the, the king noticed it. And so the king asked Nehemiah, he says, what troubles you? Is there something uh, sick at heart? And then Nehemiah had to confess his situation, and that was he was concerned for the people that he loved and for the city that uh, was the city of, of the true and the living God. And so it's under these circumstances now that it says, And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. What is transpiring here, if you understand the history of ancient Israel, good morning. If you understand the history of ancient Israel, the broken down gates and the walls of Jerusalem are not an anomaly that happens by accident. But in this history, they are the result of an experience that was gained through apostasy during the uh, many years of apostasy in the history of the divided kingdom of the north and the south, Israel being in the north and Jerusalem being in the south. And the ultimate uh, final display of this apostasy is when Nehemiah now is here at night viewing uh, the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and the gates thereof that were consumed. And this idea of them being broken down, there was a breach in the walls. And uh, the protection for the city was no longer there to protect the people of God. And Nehemiah was sent under a royal decree, the fourth decree uh, of the king of Persia, to finish the work of, uh, that had begun under the first return of the exiles in 536 under King Cyrus. Then we had a, another decree under Darius in 519. And this is the famous decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus that begins the 2300-day prophecy that ends in uh, 1844 on October 22nd. And th th this history is based on the fact that there has been a breach made in the kingdom of God in the time of the Israelites. Turn to Amos. Chapter 9. There's a lot of things I would like to cover this week, but I can't get to them all. But I want to point you in this direction so you can see something about the mercy and the love of God in dealing with uh, the breach in the wall at Jerusalem and what it means to be modern Israel today. Uh, in chapter 9 of Amos, in verse 9 and 10 and 11, it says, For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. And this is a promise and it's prophetic. And it's being fulfilled. This, this Amos, the book of Amos was given in 787 B.C., back here in 787. But the promise is being fulfilled not only in the day of Nehemiah, but this promise is also going to be fulfilled in our day. Notice what it says in verse 10. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword. That literally took place in the city of Jerusalem uh, when Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he attacked the city three times, first in 606 and the last in 588. And in 588, the city was completely destroyed and the temple was burnt. And Amos says, All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, The evil shall not overtake us nor prevent us. So there's a warning here about what it means not to receive the warnings of God if, you're, if you are His people. And in verse 11 it says, in that, day I will, in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up His ruins and will build it as in the days of old. This is talking about the same work that Nehemiah now is doing. He's repairing the breaches in the wall. And the breaches in Amos is a, the, what took place in the history of ancient Israel. When the kingdom was divided under Jeroboam and Rehoboam, there was a breach in the Davidic kingdom. And that's what it means when it says that the tabernacle of David is fallen. The house of David was divided in two halves. And it's going to be restored as it was in the old days. There was a time in the history of in the kingdom of David under, under King David and Solomon that the kingdom was united. And the promise is that... Uh, God is going to reunite Ephraim and Judah. And Ephraim will not be envious of Judah, and Judah will not vex Ephraim. And the story of Nehemiah reflects on that. Now, if you return to, to Nehemiah 9, it says, 
excuse me, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, we were at uh, verse 13. And I went out by night, it was in the dark, by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, into the drunk dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof there were, that were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to, be, to pass. Then I went up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not whether I went, or what I did. Did you know that most of the leaders in Adventism aren't watching this video this morning? And they don't know what we're up to. Now, but we do. And Nehemiah had a plan. Now listen to what he does. And the rulers knew not whether I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates of there are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no more be a reproach. Now this is the history of Adventism. Now, Ellen White has a comment about this in Prophets and Kings, page 636. She says, It was on the third night after his arrival. Now, the Bible told us that he was there for three days, but the spirit of prophecy, you'll, you'll find out this week, some who believe it cannot be used as a guide. What book was that? Prophets and Kings, page 636. Some believe in our church today that Ellen White is not a guide to uh, understanding the Bible. They don't believe that she's necessary. But nevertheless, it says here, on the third night after his arrival, Nehemiah rose at midnight and with a few trusted companions went out to view for himself the desolation of Jerusalem. And that's where I got the title for my talk this week. It's called The Desolation of Jerusalem. <clears throat> and from what we will discuss this week, you will see that Jerusalem, modern Israel today, which is the Seventh-day Adventist church, is in a state of desolation. She is not as she should be. No longer do we believe that this is the everlasting gospel. These two charts today are in the ash can of Adventist history, and they're not to be used according to many who today are speaking from our pulpits. And I would contend that these are the breaches in the wall about, about, about Jerusalem. And if we would go out like Nehemiah did at night, and notice that Ellen White says it was the third night and it was at midnight. Now this story is full of uh, anecdotes from the, from the history of the Millerites. It was in the time of the midnight cry that the walls were surveyed in the time of the Millerites. And it was uh, in a time of darkness that the, that the Adventist truth came into the world. This is the, this is the 1260 years of papal persecution. This, also, this history also includes the enemies of the people of God, and uh, it really is a close uh, relationship in this story to modern Israel. It says, On the third night after his arrival, Nehemiah rose at midnight and with a few trusted companions went out to view for himself the desolation of Jerusalem. And I would submit, by God's grace, we are going to get a view of the desolations of Jerusalem this week. Mounted on his mule, he passed from one part of the city to another, surveying the broken down walls and the gates of the cities of his fathers. Now, I, would, I would suggest to you that this behind me are now the broken down walls and the gates of the city of our fathers. Painful reflections. Notice, painful reflections filled the mind of the Jewish patriot as with sorrow-stricken heart he gazed upon the ruined defenses of his beloved Jerusalem. These are the defenses of Nehemiah's beloved Jerusalem, if today you are Nehemiah. But if you are Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Ammonite, when they heard that this work was being done, it, ga it gave them, it, it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Memories of Israel's past greatness stood out in sharp contrast with the evidences of her humiliation. I would suggest to you to, to, to transport these histories to the ash can of Seventh-day Adventist history 
Ellen White describes it here as the evidences of her humiliation. Now with that brief introduction, <clears throat> what we are going to look at this week is the desolation of Jerusalem. And with it we are going to see how we became in the place we are today where there are a thousand voices in Adventism that do not agree on any one given subject. Yes. And I do believe it's because they have left the foundations. Ellen White writes in early writings, page 74, that in this history all were united. But today we can't say that. As a matter of fact, today you can go to any Adventist church on the block that you want to go to in any state in the Union or for that matter anywhere on the globe today and you can find hardly any agreement among us as a people on various doctrinal issues. And in this history, doctrine and the love for souls in Christ have been separated. But really the reality is, is that the doctrine of Christ, you'll find out what that means later on this week, the righteousness of Christ has always been in this history. There's never, been, there's never been a time that Christ was not in this history. But we as a people have separated Him from that history. And therefore then we went about to remake that history. And in so doing we tried to put Christ back in a history that is not the true history of Seventh-day Adventism. And so we don't understand the comment of Ellen White when she writes that the third angel's message is the righteousness of Christ in verity. The word verity means in truth. So in the history of the Millerites and the history of Sabbatarian Adventism, what you see is the history of the righteousness of Christ. And in the Great Controversy, page uh, 606, Ellen White writes about this history. Six Great Controversy. This is Prophets and Kings. Great Controversy, 606. That's not the one I want. It's 611, page 611. She says, it starts on uh, page 610. Let me read it. But so long as Jesus remains man's intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. It still controls to some extent the laws of the land. Were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it is now. You ought to reflect upon that as we are in the year 2011. While many of our rulers are active agents of Satan, God is also his, has His agents among the leading men of the nations. That's because the everlasting gospel is to all the nations of the earth. That's why I call this the times of the Gentiles. The enemy moves upon his servants to, purpose, to propose measures that would greatly impede the work of God, but statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by holy angels to oppose such propositions with unanswerable ar arguments. Thus a few men will hold in check a powerful current of evil. The opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained that the third angel's message may do its work. This has to do with the story of Nehemiah. There were three enemies in the story of Nehemiah, Sandoblet, the Horonite, Tobiah, the servant of the Ammonite. And uh, she says, The opposition of the enemies of truth will be restrained, that the third angel's message may do its work. When the final warning message shall be given, it will, be, it will arrest the attentions of these leading men through whom the Lord is now working, and some of them will accept it, and will stand with the people of God through the time of trouble. Now the people of God that these men are going to stand with are men who have received the message that are behind me on these two charts. That's what the context of Ellen White's statement. She's not disassociating this history from those who will stand with the people of God when, when the decree goes forth and when the Sunday law is in the land. But the people of God are represented by those who followed the everlasting gospel contained on these two charts. Then she says, the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. This is Revelation chapter 18. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. 
The Advent movement of 1840 through 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. Now, it was, it was also a manifestation of the power of God as he brings the exiles out of Babylon. And modern Israel had the same experience. And so the history of Nehemiah can be overlaid in the history of the Millerites and also be overlaid now in the history of Sabbatarian Adventists, which are at the end of the world. I might point out that we're down here now in the year... Well, I don't have it up there. We're down here now in the year 2011. And we're waiting for the Sunday Law. Now, you can discard these truths if you'd like. But if you take a close look at this history, we're in the year 2011, and the next thing to take place in the United States in fulfillment of Bible prophecy will be the Sunday Law. Now, you might think twice before you throw this history out, in the face of the fact that we're facing the Sunday law. Now, where we've gone astray in Adventism is our understanding of how we interpret the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That's why we have so many voices in the church. One man says this, one man says that. But in the story of Nehemiah, it says one man. He, had, he understood what Jerusalem needed. And what he did was he went out and surveyed the ruins of the city. And he, he saw the desolations of the city. But the story should give us a lot of courage because Nehemiah finished the work. And the, and the city was rebuilt and the walls thereof. And, and the broken down walls were repaired. And the people of God had a defense. So if we correctly understand these things, we need to understand how it is that we became the remnant people of God through uh, the divine word. In... Go to Timothy, chapter 3, and verse 16. I think it's 1 Timothy. Let me look. Or is it 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy, right? Yes, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, and verse 16. This is an all-inclusive statement about the Bible, both the New and the Old Testament. Now, the Bible writer who's writing this is Paul the Apostle. And he's writing to his companion in the gospel, Timothy. And this is the uh, time in which Paul is in prison. And Paul is about to be sacrificed. He's going to give his all for, to the gospel. And he's admonishing his son in the gospel, Timothy. To uh, He says, verse 16, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Notice what it says. Here's the man that was uh, demonstrated in the book of Nehemiah. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This is the man that Nehemiah was, and this is the man that God wants us to be. Uh, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And it's through God's word. Now, there's a very enlightening chapter in the great controversy about this. It's in the introduction. I, I find it very interesting that the Spirit of God, who gives us the great controversy... Uh, it's in the introduction on Roman numeral 7 is the page. Roman numeral 7, V11. She says this about God's Word. In His Word, God has committed to men the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of His will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of experience. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teachings, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That was from the Revised Standard Version. Yet the fact that God has revealed His will to men through His Word has not rendered needless the continued presence and guiding of His Holy Spirit. On the contrary, the Spirit was promised by our Savior to open the Word to His servants to illuminate and apply its teachings. And since it was the Spirit of God that inspired the Bible, it is impossible that the teachings of the Spirit should ever be contrary to that of the Word. The Spirit and the Word are always going to agree. She says, the Spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible. 
For the scriptures explicitly state that the word of God is the standard by which all teachings and experience must be tested, says the Apostle John. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, 1 John 4.1. And Isaiah declares, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, is because there's no light in them. Looking for a place here, just to give me a sec. On, on page also, uh, Roman numeral 5, she makes this statement about the Word of God. During the first 2,500 years of human history, there was no written revelation. Those who had been taught of God communicated their knowledge to others, and it was handed down from father to son through successive generations. Jeff did a talk in uh, Leone Meadows, is that right? Leone Meadows. Uh, I always want to call it Lodi, but it's Leone Meadows. And he gave a talk on the four generations of Adventism. Now, if you haven't seen it, you need to get it and, and take a look at it. Excuse me. Notice here that Sister White says that, I'll read it again. Those who had been taught of God communicated their knowledge to others, and it was handed down from father to son through successive generations. Now, this is not necessarily uh, just to, to limit us to the understanding of uh, a rigid chronological set of time, like 70 years to each generation. What it means is, is that the truths of God's Word were passed on from father to son. And that's how it was communicated before there was the written document. Good morning, sister. And uh, so she says, The preparation of the written Word began in the time of Moses. We can see that right here. This is the exodus from Egypt right here. So the written, before that, it was communicated by the mouth to father to son, from generation to generation. The historian, the historian of creation and the law, to John, the recorder of the most sublime truths of the gospel. Let me read it again. This work continued during the long period of 1,600 years, from Moses, the historian of creation and the law, to John, the revelator, the recorder of the most sublime truths of the gospel. Notice that she says that John's book is the most sublime truths of the gospel. From Moses to Revelation. The Bible points to God as its author, yet it was written by human hands. This is very important as we get into the, some more things we're going to discuss this week. I want you to remember this. The Bible points to God as its author, yet it was written by human hands, and in the varied style of its different books, it presents the characteristics of the several writers. In other words, whether we recognize it or not, when you read the book of Ezra, you're seeing something about Ezra, otherwise you wouldn't be able to know. When you read the book of Nehemiah, you see something about Nehemiah that you are privileged to know because he was inspired by God, but yet he was the man who wrote the book. Uh, that isn't exactly true about Nehemiah because Ezra wrote the book of Nehemiah. But nevertheless, you get some insights to the characters of these men. It says, The truths revealed are all given by the inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16. Yet they are expressed in the words of men. The Infinite One by His Holy Spirit has shed light into the minds and hearts of His servants. He has given dreams and visions, symbols and figures, and those to whom the truth was thus revealed have themselves embodied the thought in human language. This is marvelous. This is really a wonderful thing that God would condescend to give to us the everlasting gospel in the voice and language and in the thoughts and in the feelings of men. Notice what she says about this. The Ten Commandments were spoken by God Himself and were written by His own hand. They are of divine and not of human composition. But the Bible, with its God-given truths expressed in the language of men, presents a union of the divine and the human. 
Such a union existed in the nature of Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. And I should say that when Ella White writes in early writings, page 74, that the brethren were united in 1840 and 1841 and 1842 and 1843 and 1844, it was because of the divine union of the Son of Man and His divine nature in the everlasting gospel in that history, which brought union to their understanding of the Bible truths that are behind me presented on these two charts. Thus it is true of the Bible as it was of Christ, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So when you look at these two charts, you're looking at the Son of God, whether you can recognize it or not. And He is the everlasting gospel. Now, some in the church today will remonstrate against my position, but nevertheless, we will push forward. She says, Written in different ages by men who differed widely in rank and occupation and in mental and spiritual endowments, the books of the Bible present a wide contrast in style as well as in diversity in the nature of the subjects unfolded. Different forms of expression are employed by different writers. Often the same truth is more strikingly presented by one than by the other. And as several writers present a subject under varied aspects and relations, there may appear to the superficial, careless, or prejudiced reader to be discrepancy or contradiction where the thoughtful, reverent student with clearer insight discerns the underlying harmony. Harmony is unity. As presented through different individuals, the truth is brought out in its varied aspects. One writer is more strongly impressed with one phase of the subject, he grasps the, those points that harmonize with his experience. Notice it harmonizes with his experience or with his power of perception and appreciation. Another seizes upon a different phase and each under the guidance of the Holy Spirit presents what is most forcibly impressed upon his own mind. A different aspect of the truth in each, but a perfect harmony through all. This is critical and you want to understand what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist at the end of the world. This is a divinely inspired look at the Word of God. And the truths thus revealed unite to form a perfect whole, adapted to meet the wants of men in all the circumstances and experience of life. God has been pleased to communicate His truth to the world by human agencies, and He Himself, by His Holy Spirit, qualified men and enabled them to do this work. He guided the mind in the selection of what to speak and what to write. The, treasures, the treasure was entrusted to earthen vessels, yet it is none the less from heaven, with a capital H. The testimony is conveyed through the imperfect expression of human language, yet it is the testimony of God, and the obedient, believing child of God beholds in it the glory of the divine power, full of grace and truth. This was demonstrated in the time of the Millerites, and Sister White described it as a glorious manifestation of the power of God. Now, to get a good grasp of this, you're going to have to read the Great Controversy through several times. You're going to have to understand the history of the Millerites better than we do today. And that will take personal effort on the part of those who want to understand what I'm trying to express. And I apologize for my uh, humanity. It's probably not the best vehicle to present this, but we're going to push forward by God's grace and try to give it our best, okay? Now, there is a subject that recently that inspired this talk this week. I was planning to come here and do something else, but my dear wife, I have been privileged to live in a place in California for the, all of my life, except for the first four years. I was in Nebraska, but... And I was not born into the Seventh-day Adventist church. I was born into a home that was Lutheran. And I became a Seventh-day Adventist in 1971, baptized in 73. And the point in which I then began to collect Adventist material, in some respects, you know, it, it has become, you know, I've got a lot of books. And so it is a lot, it's, it, if, if, if I think about moving, it's going to be just a lot of work to move all those books. But nevertheless... Because of my book, uh, Love for Adventist Material, Jackie and I have been uh, married now, going on 13 years. And since Jackie has been married to me, she also has 
come in contact with the two places that I have uh, also used to probably more than any other place get all the books that I have at home on Adventist history. There are two thrift stores in Loma Linda and those two thrift stores have really been a boon uh, to my experience as an Adventist because it allowed me to, uh, all the people that have lived and died there since the 1906 era and let their family who didn't want their books and threw them out, they gave them to the thrift store. We have purchased vast quantities of those books and we have them in our home. So Jackie was at the thrift store six or eight weeks ago and she brought this book home. And it's called The Role of Biblical Hermeneutics in Preserving Unity in the Church. Now this particular book is written by a gentleman who is a, in his own words, he is a progressive. Now that word uh, has throughout time changed its meaning depending on who's using it. And uh, what he means by that is he's liberal in his thoughts. He's liberal. And so some of the things that I'm going to present can come from a, of a, li a liberal point or a progressive point of view inside of Adventism. And what you're going to get to see this week is you're going to get on your mule with Nehemiah and you're going to go about and view the wall for yourself and you're going to get a look at the desolation of Jerusalem. And this little book is one of the means by which we are going to show just how bad it is in the church today is regarding the subject that we just covered in, the, in reading the introduction to the Great Controversy on how we uh, see uh, how God has uh, given to us His Word and how we have interpreted it. Now, he sets out with this. Now, I'm going to repeat his own words. Our object today is not to discuss per se, any particular doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but in a whole, it's to look at how we have come as a people to view our doctrines in various fashions or light, depending upon how we understand how we should interpret the Word. He wrote this coming back from the, excuse me, 1995 General Conference at Eurtech. I believe it was in Europe. And this man served the church uh, in employment and in retirement for 70 years. He died at the age of 92 years. He, his forefathers were Seventh-day Baptists. And the keeping of the Sabbath in his family goes back for 400 years. And his ancestors became Millerites and they became Sabbatarian Adventists. But before they were that, they were Sabbath keepers. His name is Raymond Cottrell, or Cottrell. This is Raymond Cottrell. Now, this is not to say anything bad about Brother Cottrell, but this is to give you his point of view on what he believes is the correct form of biblical hermeneutics. Now, I don't agree with his understanding, but I thought you might be interested to know because of the influence he's had in the church of how he understood how we should uh, understand how to interpret the Bible. And when you understand these things that I'm now understanding, you'll see where we are today in Adventism. And now, then you won't have to wonder why we are the way we are. You will know. And then you will see what it means to understand that the church is in a desolation, in my opinion. But what he writes here is, is that on his return from uh, Utrecht, it's, it's U-T-R-E-C-T-H, is the, how do you spell it? And he is disappointed because of the lack of unity that he saw there within the no denomination as a whole. And what happened was this, that in that year, the North American Division wanted to elevate the standard in the church for women's ordination to be accepted. But it was voted down at the GC in 1995. And the reason he states that it was is because the third world population of the church, which now controls the majority of the votes or power within the General Conference, did not agree with the North Americans' decision to allow women's ordination. So he's not writing this, per se, to discuss women's ordination, but what he's writing this to do is to discuss how proper and improper hermeneutics will affect the unity of the church. You follow? So he goes on now to, he's going to give us his understanding of what proper biblical hermeneutics is, but in doing so, he's going to compare the biblical hermeneutics of William Miller. 
So you're going to see both sides now. And you can decide for yourself who's correct. Now, if we understand what Ellen White and the Bible has just said about the Bible and its inspiration, you can conclude from what she's stating, what the Bible is revealing, that this man is in error. But yet he went to his grave. He died in the year 2003, unfortunately, but he went to his grave believing that the sanctuary doctrine was not valid based on his own hermeneutical principles. These are the hermeneutical principles that was instilled in Desmond Ford. These were the hermeneutical principles that were also guiding William W. Prescott. These were the hermeneutical principles that are today guiding not all, but a, but a good portion of the church today. Uh, Fritz Guy at La Sierra is guided by these principles. The, the man who's no longer the president of La Sierra University, Garrity, is no, is no longer there, but he's still amongst the denomination. I forget where he went, but he's been replaced by someone else. And he is guided also by the same hermeneutical principles as was uh, Raymond Cottrell. And you're going to get a fascinating history this week on how this came into the church and what work it's been doing and what it is still doing in the context of uh, placing these histories now before the fourth generation of Adventism and why the fourth generation of Adventism today sees no validity in the foundations of Adventism. And it's based upon the progressive understanding of the biblical hermeneutics of this one man, Raymond Cottrell. So with that said, let's take a look here at what he says about uh, biblical hermeneutics. Uh, let me just flip right away to something. How many of you know what hermeneutics is, the word, by a raise of hands? Very few. All right, let's, the definition is this. He says, for these modes of Bible reading, no special training or expertise is necessary. He goes through a list of how you can read the Bible. You can read it for a pleasure. You can read it for its literary uh, sources, its masterpieces, the literary. You can read it for inspiration, consultation, or you can just plain read the Bible, whatever your reason for reading it. He says, for these modes of Bible reading, there is no special training needed. So if you just want to pick up your Bible, you don't need to be trained. Now, I agree with him on that, okay? He says, but for Bible study with the objective of recovering the exact meaning the inspired writers intended their words to convey, a reliable hermeneutics is essential. Okay? And what is a hermeneutic? Question mark. The word hermeneutic is derived, notice this, from the Greek word herminio. H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-O. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. I don't know Greek. I'm grateful I don't know Greek, I think. It says, it means to interpret, which in turn was based on the name Hermes. Now, who is Mr. Hermes? He is the legendary messenger or interpreter of the gods. So he's pagan. All right? So we have, a, we have within the Christian church a thing called hermeneutics based on the name of a pagan god which helps us to interpret the word of God. Now, let's, let's try to match wits with that if we can. <laughs> All right? A biblical hermeneutic is a method by which to interpret and understand God's messages to us on record in the Bible. Now, let's not be children. We understand that the word is being used to define the word interpretation. But nevertheless, I find it amusing somewhat that we are using this word to define how to interpret the divine word. I think, what do we got, 10 minutes? For the last hour, we got 10 minutes left? Okay. Now, so, he says about biblical hermeneutics, the importance of it. He says that it's, Speaking of this historic vote within the General Conference that would not allow the North American Division to get women's ordination, he says, that historic vote also escalated awareness of the crucial importance of biblical hermeneutics in the formation of doctrine and church policy. To the unity of the church, to an unprecedented level. To him, what he saw there was, in earlier parts of the book, he describes the uh, the unlearned condition of the Third World Seventh-day Adventist population of the General Conference. 
They are unlearned, and so therefore they do not rightly understand Bible doctrine. To him, they are just country bumpkins, unable to understand for themselves the Word of God because they aren't properly trained. So now he goes on to say, unless we as Seventh-day Adventists resolve this diverse, di divisive difference in biblical hermeneutics, it has the potential of making two Adventist churches inevitable, one for open-minded people, that would be him, who base their conclusion on Bible principles, and one for closed-minded people who feel more secure with their, I quote, immature, literalistic, authoritarian reading of the Bible. Now, before we get too far into this, this man was the major contributor to the SDA Bible Commentary. For us as Seventh-day Adventists, this hermeneutical issue resolves itself into the ultimate question as to whether we, as a community of faith, can be mature enough, open enough to base our reading of the Bible on the weight of Bible evidence, or whether we permit preconceived opinions about the Bible to close our minds to the weight of evidence. We urgently need dialogue. Now, he's going to continue his dialogue. How much time do I have? Ten minutes? Nine minutes. And then he goes on now. He's going to tell us why the Bible is understood in so many different ways. All right? Now, I noticed... I, I, I was personally affected by his statement here because when I first started studying the Bible, I couldn't read. And it was through the reading of God's Word that I am able to do what I am able to do today. Now, so he says here about this, he says, The Bible is the most remarkable literary document of all times. Its concept of life and the existence of all things has influenced the thinking and lives of more people over a longer period of time than any other book. It continues to attract the careful study of a broad spectrum of readers, all the way from people who consider it a strictly human product to others who are profoundly committed to it as the inspired Word of God. You know, there are people that are committed to it as the inspired Word of God, but yet their, their approach to it is from a human standpoint. They really don't believe it is. Well, but he says, and from people who can scarcely able to read. That's me. Okay? To scholars who devote their lives to understanding it. So I was a guy that once couldn't even read, but now... I don't call myself a scholar, but I praise the Lord that I can read. But it was through His Word that I was enabled to do so. No other literary docu document has attracted much universal attention or been under understood in such a variety of ways as the innumerable subdivisions of Christendom around the world make evident. Why is, why, why is so important and influential a piece of literature understood in so many different ways? Is the Bible a sort of Delphiac oracle that can mean anything a person wants it to mean? To the contrary. The Bible writers addressed... Now, here, here now he begins to inculcate you into his philosophy of correct biblical hermeneutics. Notice what he says. The Bible writers addressed explicit messages to particular people in the context of specific historical circumstances. Sounds good, right? The reason for the often contradictory ways in which the Bible is understood consists of the presuppositions, principles, and procedures people follow as they read it. Obviously, reliable hermeneutical principles and procedures are of major importance. What he's saying is this, that William Miller, well, let me just read it for you. second. I thought I had that marked. Let 
Anyway, he goes on to say, there are two basic methods uh, uh, by which people read the Bible and try to understand it. These two methods look at the Bible from opposite directions and often come to opposite conclusions as, as to what it means. One reads it from the viewpoint of what its words in translation, mark that down, mean to us today from our modern perspective of life. He's, he's comparing how we read it from our perspective and how it was written according to the perspective of the time as the men that wrote it. He wants to make a distinction between how we see it and how they actually intended it to be seen and wrote. And he's saying that what we need to, how we need to translate it is from their view of the world and not our own. And to rightly understand the Bible, we can't use our view of the world. We have to use their view of the world. And he, he calls this the historical method. All right? He says, one reads it from the viewpoint of what its words in translation mean to us today from our modern perspective of life, society, culture, and salvation history, and the world about us as if the writers had us in mind as they wrote. Now, I think they did have us in mind as they wrote. Right, the Spirit of God was the one who inspired the book, right? And the men, whether they recognized it or not, that's, 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 that's an irrelevant point. If, if they didn't recognize that they were writing for us, the Spirit of God was writing it for every age. Is that right? Amen. Amen. The other method reads the Bible looking for the meaning they intended. Their words to convey from their perspective of life, society, culture, salvation, history, and the world, and as their contemporaries would understand that they wrote. In other words, you have to get into the skin of Daniel and become Daniel to really understand what Daniel's telling you. You can't understand it from your world perspective. That's his conclusion. Then having found the meaning they intended to convey, this method looks for the divine principles and instructions reflected in a Bible passage and how they applied to that particular situation in order to know how those principles and instructions apply to us today. He says now, the first of the two methods of reading and understanding the Bible usually goes by the name of proof text method, which often takes Bible statements and passages out of their original historical and literary context and applies them directly to our time, often under very different circumstances to which they do not apply. This, excuse me. The second usually goes by the same, the second usually goes by the name historical method. I want you to remember the word historical method, okay? When I read this document, that's the first time I'd ever heard the, that, those words used together in that form. Historically, we are historicists using the proof text method. Miller was a historicist. That means that history had to match what the prophecy was saying. The two had to go, uh, agree. And that was used, used with, an, with an agreement of history, the Bible or, or the proof text method would agree with history. And that was called the historicist interpretation of the Bible. But here he's talking about a thing called the historical method, which is not the historicist method, okay? Because, it's for, because it first reads the Bible in its own literary and historical context with the ultimate objective of understanding how to apply its principles and instructions to our time and circumstances. With this principle is the reason that Raymond Cottrell went to his grave denying the investigative judgment. That's how he did it. That's how Ford did it too. The big difference of the proof text method, if there are any advantages, is that it requires no special training or experience. Now, I didn't bring it along, but I have it up at my trailer. When I first read this, it struck me very, very keenly that the King James Bible, by the way, we're celebrating its 400th year. I don't know if you are, but I am. Most people don't recognize this is the 400th year of the writing of the King James Bible in the English tongue. And it, it really is an achievement. And a secular radio program that I listen to on, on sometimes on the radio, which is funded by socialists, the communists, they had a half-hour article, a, a program on the glories of the King James Bible and how it is a, a nation builder and a freedom builder and how it brings literacy and education and high attainments to the human race. I, I found it, frankly, quite refreshing 
even though it came from a communist socialist source. But we as Adventists have not recognized that source. As a matter of fact, we've taken the King James Bible and we've thrown it in the ash can along with this history. And William Tyndale wrote one time, he said that I am going to make sure every plowboy knows more about the sacred word than you do. And he was talking to a Catholic prelate. And guess who turned out to be the, the plowboy? William Miller. William Miller is the plowboy. He was a farmer from upper state New York. And he was reading his King James Bible. When the, when the Holy Spirit told him, go and tell it to the world. He was fulfilling the prophecy of William Tyndale with the King James Bible. So this man says the big advantage of the proof text method, if there are any advantages, is that it requires no special training or experience. Amen. Amen. <laughs> In fact, a person need not even be aware of following any method. For most people, the big disadvantage of the historical method is, that's the advantages, he says, of the proof text. But he says, but for most people, the big disadvantage of the historical method is that it does require training and experience. Now, how many of you understood the te testimony in Isaiah that they took the Bible to the learned and he says, it's, it's a sealed book to me, and then the unlearned says, well, I can't learn it because I'm not learned, right? So there's a dilemma there, right? One is learned, but he can't read it because it's sealed, and the other one can't read it because he's not learned. They're, they're, in, a, they're in a rough place, right? It says here, for most people, the big disadvantage of the historical method is that it does require training and experience. You have to be learned, okay? Fortunately, however, those who have not had the privilege of that training and experience can still follow the historical method by making use of information those who have that training have provided. Isn't that nice? More about that later, he says. So how much time do I have left? I'm done. Okay, with that, uh, we'll, we'll continue this in the next hour. So, uh, shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, Lord, it requires more than talent. It requires more than human to uh, read the Bible and to study it and, and to present these talks. It requires uh, your divine aid. Loving Father in heaven, we would implore you that for those watching and for listening on the internet and for those here present today and for myself, that the aid of your Holy Spirit, Lord, would encourage us and strengthen us and give us wisdom above ourselves. Even though, Lord, we have no training, even though, Lord, we uh, speak with stammering lips and with no education, we hope, dear Lord, that by your grace you will teach us from your word. Be gracious to us, dear Lord, and pour out your spirit in the latter rain power that those may, that hear these things will understand that they can view the desolation of Jerusalem and it's not hopeless, but you have a great victory looking forward for those who will stand upon your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.